Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's talk about a clinical trial approved to study Chinese herbs and mushrooms for COVID-19. Tonight's talk will focus on Chinese herbal portion of the study, but hopefully we'll be doing another talk, hopefully in October, focusing on the medicinal mushroom arm of, this, of the study. Uh, my name is Jack Miller. I'm the chairman of Pacific College of Health and Science. Um, Pacific College is co-hosting this live webinar with LASA OMS. I have to say that LASA has been a great friend to the college and to this profession. They're always a, a supporter of Pacific Symposium, which is coming up very soon, and always very, very generous to the attendees that, that go to the symposium. So, um, and also they sell, they will be selling some of the formulas mentioned here tonight, okay? This webinar is a natural progression from the series of webinars that we did with Lhasa and Dr. J uh, John Chen over the past year or more about the herbal treatment of COVID-19. You can find those previous webinars on Pacific College's YouTube channel, okay? Um, John Chen will introduce the speakers tonight who will include the, the investigators from University of California. Um, Gordon Sachs, a good friend of our college, um, Andrew Shuboff and Lon Kao. Um, they will be joined towards the end of the presentation for a live Q&A panel discussion with Pacific Professor Emeritus, our good friend Zev Rosenberg. And Zev was also very instrumental in the development of the plan for this study. You can put your questions in the YouTube chat box, okay? And we will pose them to the panelists during the Q&A. Um, if the question is for a particular speaker, please note that. Um, I'll also mention that Cynthia Nypers, our Director of Outreach and Alumni Services, will be that moderator. So if you hear someone talking that's not me, it's most likely uh, Cynthia. Um, and I should also mention, if you're not part of our alumni network and you're an alum of Pacific College, introduce yourself to, to Cynthia and she'll get you connected. So. Um, to start, I'd like to introduce John Chen. John is a recognized authority in both Western pharmacology and Chinese herbal medicine, and has taught at many of the Chinese medicine colleges, and he's also served as a worldwide resource for Chinese medicine. Um, he is the author of a Materia Medica and Formulas book that are foundational in Chinese medicine learning. Um, he's considered a foremost authority on Chinese herbal treatment for COVID-19, which if you listen to the previous webinars, you will agree with heartily. His generosity to the profession for sharing that knowledge through those webinars has been incredible. So John, it's really my honor and pleasure to introduce you to this broad audience tonight. Oh, thank you, Jack. And also thank you to Pacific College and Lhasa OMS for co-hosting this event. Um, this is the fourth or fifth uh, webinars that we are doing on Chinese medicine and COVID-19. And it's just a progression of all the things that we have done to bring us to this point. Okay, so at this moment, I'm gonna share with you my PowerPoint. All right, so I'm gonna do the introduction today, but the main speakers will be Dr. Andrew Shuboff, Gordon Sachs, and also Lan Kao. Uh, they really are the one that deserve all the credit for today's talk, as well as all the work uh, that we have done. Okay, so um, what I will do here is I will uh, zoom out just a bit to give our audience, audience today uh, a chance to see the bigger picture. And at the same time, uh, give, a, give you a quick introduction into the herbal formula that they are studying in case if you're not familiar with it. Uh, hopefully that will uh, set the stage a little bit better as the three main speakers start and talk about all the things they have done in the last year or so. All right, so um, this here is a book called The Guidance for Coronavirus Disease. And this is a book published by the Chinese government. And what it has done is basically taking all the experience that are compiled by city, provincial, and also national level of all the things they have done to treat COVID-19 and put it into one version. So all the practitioner can easily access it. This book is available in both English and also Chinese. Um, so regardless of 
what your background is, you should be able to access a version that you can read. Uh, if you click on the hyperlink, uh, it will take you right to where the book is and you can download it for free. All right. And specifically for the TCM part, what you will notice is that it's true to the root of Chinese medicine in that it breaks down the disease into many different types and many different pattern differentiation as well as treatment. So you have the medical observation period, clinical treatment period, where there's mild, moderate, severe, or critical. And the last part should actually be a big bullet, which is a recovery period. So depending on their signs and symptom and TCM presentation, the treatment is going to be different. But what happened in this particular case is COVID-19 comes on so fast and so sudden. So in China, in Wuhan, when this first happened, they don't really have the luxury to see each person individually, take the tongue, look at the tongue, take the pulse, especially since many practitioners were in hazmat suit. So in essence, what they have to do is design a one size fits all formula so they can quickly treat as many people as possible. So what you have here is under the second bullet, there is a line that says general type of COVID for the mild to moderate. So what they have done is they devised a formula called Qing Fei Pai Du Tang, which is the modified, which is the clear the lung and detoxifying decoction. So this is what they felt is the most suitable for most everyone who have a mild to moderate case of COVID-19. So this is the one size fits all. This is the first line treatment that they were using for almost all patients uh, with COVID. All right. And the idea behind this one formula was they took the essence of four formulas and they and then modify it a bit and combine it into one. And those four additional formulas are Ma Xing Si Gan Tang, Se Gan Ma Huang Tang, Xiao Cai Hu Tang, and Wu Ling San. And the English translation of these four formulas are right here on the PowerPoint, so I won't repeat them. But what this one formula or four classic formula is trying to do is to treat both the cause and also the symptoms to help to eliminate the virus and also alleviate many of the signs and symptoms. So basically it helps to clear lung heat, ventilate the lung, to eliminate the toxin, eliminate the phlegm and harmonize the patient and so on. All right, so that's the overall goal to help to treat the early to mid stage of COVID-19. And then if you dive one step deeper, you will notice that this is a very large formula with 21 individual ingredients. So they were quite aggressive with the treatment. You know, it's not a small dose, it's a large dose with many different herbs. And they were giving this formula as an herbal decoction. All right. And in fact, they had very good success with this formula. And what happened is, of course, COVID starts to spread to all the rest of the province in China and very quickly all throughout the world. So what happened is many countries tried to um, copy the same formula and give it to their citizens. Um, but what happened is there were challenges. And the main reason is because there were three herbs that were very difficult to source, either because they are illegal or they are unavailable. And those three herbs are primarily Ma Huang, Herba Ephedra, Guan Donghua, Pyrid uh, Flosphora, and also Xi Xin Asara. And they contain different compounds that different governments around the world were considered to be too strong as a dietary supplement and therefore classified as a drug, or they contain compounds uh, that potentially may be more toxic or may cause certain adverse reactions. And therefore, um, they may or may not be available. And that applies to the United States as well. All right. So if you do a Google search, what you'll find is that there are many different versions of this formula in capsule form, in tablet form, in the tincture form. So uh, the first thing I want to shout out to all the audience is that uh, please don't listen to this presentation and just go out and buy a product or specifically for the um, general public, since this is on YouTube. Uh, don't just go out and buy this product and treat yourself because there are a lot of things that you need to know that you may not know. So please go see a practitioner um, before uh, you decide to do anything. 
And then as a practitioner, uh, please also keep in mind that these different versions of the product are not necessarily the same as what they used in China. Number one, the formulation may be different, the dosage is gonna be different and dosage form may also be different. So make sure you consider those factors um, before you decide what's best for the patient. And I would say as a TCM practitioner, the best thing to do is since we are not in a hurry to treat these patients, we don't have hundreds or thousands of people at our doorstep at any given time, the best thing to do is to take the time, evaluate each and every patient, see what their TCM pattern is, and then treat the patient based on whatever is the best for their particular condition. So that's the way to get the best result, all right? So uh, at UCLA and UCSD, we had a lot of meeting also to try to determine what is the best way to use or modify this formula um, for use here in the United States. So I will leave it to uh, the speakers, you know, to get into the details. But overall, uh, what we have come to is that after over a year of a lot of hard work, FDA has approved the clinical trial for us to begin to evaluate both the mushrooms and also the Chinese herbal formula. And that Chinese herbal formula is the modified Qingfei Pai Tu Tang. And that's why you see the M in front of the formula, QFPD. All right. And uh, this is a brief description of the drug approval process. It's a very long and lengthy and challenging process. And there is a Chinese saying that a journey of a thousand miles must begin with one single step. Okay, so with the FDA's approval for us to begin this clinical trial, I think that's a giant leap that we have just taken. All right, so with that, um, I will turn the presentation over to Andrew Shubob, Gordon Sachs, and also Lon Kao. And I also have slides of all their accomplishments. Um, so I won't take the time to read all of them because if I do, then I'm gonna take away too much of the time for this presentation itself. But in essence, uh, Dr. Andrew Shubob and Gordon, Gordon Sack are the primary investigator for this particular study. And Lan Kao is the co-investigator specifically for the Chinese herbal medicine part. All right, so with that, I would like to go ahead and turn over the presentation to them. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, uh, Jack Miller. So our story, um, Andrew, first slide. Our story begins in late December, 2019, when we all first heard reports of a strange viral illness in Wuhan, China. Um, when I saw news reports a few weeks later that the disease had escaped Wuhan, and on the eve of Chinese New Year, I realized as an epidemiologist that the disease had the potential to become a global pandemic. And it was a really sickening feeling. So uh, fast forward to February 8, 2020. That was the day that the University of California, San Diego sponsored the first University of California wide integrative medicine research conference in La Jolla. Its purpose was to promote collaborative research and to begin to promote the development of a research network across the five sister University of California medical centers with integrative medicine research programs. So looking up the coast from here, UC San Diego, UC Irvine, UCLA, UC San Francisco, and UC Davis. So at the time of this conference, COVID had already begun to spread in the US and everyone was very concerned. Uh, during a break, the conference, I was talking with Dr. Kit Huey from UCLA Center for East-West Medicine, and I remember him describing COVID as something of a paper tiger and telling me that Chinese herbal medicine had what already appeared to be a very effective treatment. Well, that really resonated with me because at the time, I was thinking nonstop about the development of a natural medicine approach to COVID. I was particularly interested in exploring the use of medicinal or polypore mushrooms known to have broad-based immune potentiating and antiviral effects. And as Zev Rosenberg and I had discussed the role of mushrooms in Chinese herbal medicine for years. Anyway, the upshot of the conference was an agreement to continue having regular meetings to foster cross-campus research collaboration. And then next thing you know, there was the shutdown. 
UC San Diego put all non-essential research that could not be done remotely on hiatus for an indefinite period. That meant for those of us involved with the Krupp Research Endowment that our normal grant funding cycle would have to be put on hold. In its place, our board decided to instead have a special allocation for integrative research specifically focused on COVID. About that time, I was introduced to Dr. Andrew Shubob from UCLA, who shared the core idea for the Chinese herbal study. And he's gonna have a lot more to say about this in just a couple minutes. I remember suggesting to Dr. Shubob that we combine forces and find a way to meld these natural medicines into a combined study that we could then win support from the Krupp Endowment. Next slide, please. The result was the birth of the Mach 19 study, Mushrooms and Chinese Herbs for COVID-19. We're all natural, so um, warp speed was beyond our reach, uh, but we were in a hurry to help address the medical problem of our lifetimes. I also shared with Dr. Shubov that we had a research core at UCSD that could step up to the plate to help support the study. And I'd like to give a quick shout out uh, to these other members of our team without whom the Mach 19 study could not have been launched. So um, the, um, uh, the core provides a number of services as you can see here, and they range from uh, project management, phlebotomy and so forth. And, um, and really we would not have been able to do our study without the, without the support uh, and help of the members of our team. So um, anyway, uh, next slide, please. So there were really uh, uh, four studies that make up the Mach 19 trial. And just to frame them a little bit, um, the first two are uh, the two studies, one of which is study two, the study of Chinese herbal formula for uh, mild and moderately ill self-quarantining COVID patients. Um, study one follows a similar design using mushrooms and uh, both of these came in under the same IND, Investigational New Drug Approval from FDA. Um, next slide, please. The third and fourth studies are both studies of mushrooms used in the context of uh, vaccination as ways to enhance immunity beyond vaccines themselves. We'll have much more to say about this when we do the uh, presentation on the mushrooms in a few weeks, um, but for now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shubov. And, um, uh, and so, um, uh, Dr. Shubov. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sachs and, and Dr. Chen as well for the, um, for the introductions. Uh, I'm Dr. Andrew Shubov, I'm a um, lead investigator on this clinical trial. Also, uh, um, my day job is a director of inpatient integrative East-West medicine at the UCLA Center uh, at the Santa Monica Hospital at UCLA. And um, so let's start by, by kind of giving a little bit of a structure to the, to the hour here. Um, Dr. Sachs just gave an introduction of the MOX-19 clinical trials uh, focused on the, the mushroom Chinese, the mushroom component of this. I'm gonna speak for the rest of the hour. We're gonna talk more specifically about the Chinese herb component with an additional um, webinar in the next few, few weeks um, uh, or a month or two more focused on the, Chinese, on the mushrooms. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit right now about the origins of the effort and, of course, more than anything, just the intention behind what we're trying to do here. Um, that'll help with the regulatory uh, burdens uh, kind of define how we ended up where, where we're at now. Doctor, I'm then going to give it to Dr. Lan Kao, uh, who's going to tell us more about the formula in some greater detail and also talk about the safety measures that are being implemented, as well as some um, examples of how we're, we are using pattern, pattern diagnosis in the Con in the uh, circumscribed within, within the clinical trial. She'll then pass it back to me. We'll talk about the regulatory hurdles required to, to uh, perform botanical drug research in the US. Um, and this might help explain why um, there aren't more of these studies, unfortunately. If we have time at the end, I'd like to explore some options for streamlining this process because uh, this hopes to be just the, you know, one of many studies on these kinds of things. Uh, quick clarifications, just 
some housekeeping, we should let you know that the FDA approval for this extends only for the clinical trial. So this is an FDA IND approval, um, probably uh, similar to say uh, how the FDA approved the clinical trial for MDMA for PTSD, but did not approve the broad use of that yet. The, first, the, the IND application is the first step for broader approval. Um, we should also say that the study is actively recruiting, so we can't actually share any results yet from that. That's hopefully coming in the next few months. So let's talk about this clinical trial because this is, this is um, it comes from a very interesting place. Of course, March, 2020, and I'll ask you to do something painful here, which is bring yourselves back to that moment. In particular, that moment when, when this um, kind of a, a news thing turned into a worldwide shutdown. There was a, a moment where, where all denial vanished and suddenly this is happening. Um, and it was, it was terrifying. There was a lot of emotions there. Uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of upheaval and a lot of change happened very, very rapidly. And in my mind, one of the reasons for such kind of out of the control fear uh, was this idea that Western medicine somehow wasn't there for us. And I, I speak as an internist. I'm, a, you know, I'm fully immersed in Western medicine. I consider myself a Western medicine practitioner. I appreciate and value Western medicine. It's been huge. And it's been so successful over my generation that we now can expect that a heart attack or stroke can be reversed if we get to the hospital in time. That's an enormous statement. Um, many cancers, even though they're not curable or at least treatable, um, major traumas are, are survivable now. And so when we're faced with a virus that somehow flies through all of these Swiss cheese holes in the Western medical system, we're left with, with nothing left with dark ages level of help here. And it's terrifying. It's a lot. It's a lot for um, it's a lot for the for our country, certainly, and certainly uh, brought up feelings of, of panic and fear. Um, now, many of you, uh, I'm imagining because of the nature of this webinar in the audience, we may have been drawn towards alternative medicine out of a kind of an understanding that what, there are some holes in Western medicine that need filling, but for the country as a whole, it was, it's very difficult to grasp this. So um, we, at least in East-West medicine, and many of you I'm sure as well, we're familiar with Chinese medicine uh, also in terms of its history as becoming, as, as something that is uh, capable of treating infectious disease. Um, in particular, cold diseases was, was something that's been known for millennia now. And we were watching at the sidelines as we saw China was rolling out the use of Chinese herbal medicine as an integrated approach in the, uh, the, the book that uh, Dr. John Chen had just referred to as the diagnosis and treatment um, for COVID-19. Chinese herbal medicine is very clearly integrated there. And so we thought, well, this is a simple thing. Here's an opportunity where Western, where the whole country will finally start appreciating Chinese medicine for what it is. It's an option when, um, when we need these options. And instead, we didn't see that. And in fact, we saw kind of, you know, more of a blind spot. There was, um, it's almost like Chinese medicine didn't exist. It wasn't anywhere on the radar. We looked at the websites that were available and the, the literature coming out was more kind of judgmental, you know, like a, this is a scam kind of um, articles that uh, didn't properly represent what Chinese medicine could do at that time. At first, we were kind of curious by this, and eventually, we ended up quite frustrated um, and angry about this because th this is something that that needs to be fixed. This was uh, not okay. So we circled our wagons. We had a meeting uh, with the Center for East West Medicine, among those of us that wanted to do something to change. And of course, everybody at this time wanted to do something to help. And we were, you know, another one of these many groups. Um, and initially, we had three goals. One was that we could become a resource for people wanting to learn more about Chinese herbal medicine. The other more obvious one is we would become a clinical source for, uh, for telemedicine herbal uh, recommendations for COVID-19. And um, uh, the third was that um, I had just started this inpatient East-West Medicine consult service. I was working in the hospital and uh, my, my friends and coworkers were, were digging trenches for an impending onslaught. People were quarantining from their families. Uh, uh, other people were flying to New York to be on the front lines. We were watching what happened in Italy and then what happened in New York was happening at this moment. LA was next. We were terrified. Um, I wanted to be able to offer them some help. So we brought this to our chair 
um, and he swiftly shut it down. Specifically, he used the following terminology. He said, and actually, before I say this, know that this man is widely recognized as being one of the smartest minds at UCLA. And under his guidance, uh, the department has, has really done very well. He says, I certainly think that East West has much to offer in promoting wellness. However, giving the impression that herbs can mitigate COVID-19 does not seem evidence-based at this time. And I believe that you should avoid such implications. So we were clearly heartbroken. Um, and then once we thought about this again, we recognized that he's not wrong, that the like Dr. Chen was saying, if we make a recommendation, say for an herb, um, the environment of the country at that time was such that it would the misinformation would spread like wildfire and we will have people taking herbs that are not the right herbs, that are not sourced correctly, that might be frankly toxic out of the same desperation that, that led people to seek increasingly toxic um, medications and all sorts of things. Uh, and that we will cause true genuine harm. And so uh, the term that he used was that it's not evidence-based at this time. So we started looking at the evidence base and we also found that it was lacking. And not only it was lacking, there wasn't really anything on the horizon that we saw coming out. And um, this was more of a frustration than an actual call for, for help, but um, or call for us to do something about it. But clearly there was something that, that needed to happen here. And this is something that we might be better off doing than the other things. So we started looking at the resources becoming available for Chinese herbal medicine. We found out we're not the best people to, um, uh, to become a resource for, for Chinese medicine and COVID. Dr. Chen is, uh, the Pacific College is, Lhasa, uh, the um, uh, E-Lotus. These are all groups that are doing a much better job. We're not the best people to be an herbal clinic for COVID, you are. So what was within our, scope as the Center for East-West Medicine, our charge was to translate Eastern medicine to the West. And in this case, the language spoken by the West was double blind randomized control trials. And these did not exist. And so it wasn't about the herbs, it's that we were speaking the wrong language. We were speaking based on what would be called anecdotal evidence, which may be millennia of experience, but not double blind randomized controls trials. So what's needed of randomized control trials? We first started, um, the first thought was to protect our hospital uh, healthcare workers by offering them Yu Ping Feng San, which is a um, uh, prophylactic medication or herbal formula. Um, in the context of a clinical trial, maybe put one hospital on it, put one hospital not on it. There's all sorts of statistical problems uh, associated with that uh, that made us choose not to. And form, more importantly, it turned out that the infection rates among healthcare workers was actually lower than expected, which was great. So we decided to pivot. We pivoted to um, using the Chinese medicine for active COVID-19. We thought this might actually have an impact. This might be one of these levers that might change the way that Chinese medicine is perceived from the West, that maybe this will finally shine a light on, on this, this deep sense of, under, of, of knowledge that uh, the West needs right now at this moment. Once they get in, you know, they learn more about that, they might, they might be able to open their eyes bro more broadly to Chinese medicine. There were some statistical reasons as well that made this easier to study, a large hospitalization rate of 20% back then. Um, and it was also uh, doable, it was feasible because we can uh, confine the study to outpatients only. And um, the inpatient service, there was just so many research trials happening on the, in the hospital that it would have been impossible to do any research. So we presented this plan um, uh, to the UC Centers for Integrative Medicine uh, and uh, Dr. Sachs spoke more about how we got connected um, and it just turned out that he had a uh, very, very, very similar interest in studying mushrooms for COVID-19. And he had a, um, he had a team, he had a uh, support and it, it, it worked the rest of his history. We also connected with a, a few other uh, centers, uh, Lee Hollander Rubin, um, as an acupuncturist at UCSF who did an, a tremendous amount of work with us early on uh, to help, uh, help write the IND and Shaista Malik at UCI. So with the four of us, we had four centers for integrative medicine um, at UCF, UC, at the University of California. And we were, we were rolling at the end of March, which was two extremely stressful weeks. We had the following plan in place. We had a multi-center double-blinded randomized control trial for COVID-19 um, patients, outpatients confined to home quarantine. We would have two stages. One would be safety feasibility, and the second would be efficacy. 
Now the safety feasibility would be 33 patients, which is larger than a typical safety study. So that, that would allow us to actually look at some outcomes of efficacy. We would probably not actually meet statistical significance, but this would give us a sense so that we can design our next study. Well, these are available on the clinicaltrials.gov website. We don't need to get um, uh, into uh, too much detail right now. So here we are, ready to go. Um, and uh, which herbs are we going to use? What's our actual intervention going to be? Now, as Dr. Chen had uh, mentioned, there was a, he actually gave us a, a lecture around this time on the eLotus platform that provided a very clear overview uh, of the tr uh, treatment strategies based on the uh, national treatment guidelines. And primarily, as he mentioned, it's multiple formulas based on pattern diagnosis or stages of disease, or there is a kind of a one size fits all fit can dirty 21 herb formulation that's that can be used irrespective of who the patient is. Now, we didn't take this lightly. As a clinical trial, when we were designing it as a clinical trial, the, uh, the prospect of having a single intervention is wildly preferred. I mean, it's almost impossible to have a randomized control trial, certainly a blinded randomized control trial, if you have multiple formulas. On the other hand, if this is our shot to try to show uh, on the large stage how Chinese medicine is practiced, how comfortable are we at using a formula that is not the way that Chinese medicine is practiced? And it basically came down to whether or not which language are we speaking? Are we speaking Chinese medicine? Or are we speaking double blind randomized control trial? Um, this is really, really challenging for us to figure out, you know, we, we, we rapidly found out that we are not the right people to decide this. What we did was we, um, we tapped into uh, the greatest minds in Chinese herbal medicine that we could find. And one of them I've had the pleasure of working with for several years, Dr. Lan Kao, I'd like to invite up to talk more about what we did in our next steps and more about the formula that we used. Thank you, doc thank you very much, Dr. Shiba, for that um, amazing presentation. So my, my talk will be focused on the Chinese herbal medicine arm of the Mach 19 uh, trial. And before I begin, I'd like to say hello to everyone and thank you very much for the team at Pacific College as well as LASA OMS um, for their great work in organizing this event, and especially to Dr. John Chen for bringing us all together um, to speak on the clinical trials. So as a co-investigator on the team, I play the role of the Chinese herbal medicine uh, medical monitor. And it's a, it's a rather unique role because it's not often that you'll come across an RCT with an herbal medicine medical monitor on the team. So I hope this would be the first of, of many um, in the future. And as Dr. Shuboff mentioned, you know, it, we didn't rush into choosing um, the formula that we did with um, the QFPD. And so as it, we, we draw, we solicited um, expertise, I mean, not only with clinicians in-house and researchers uh, from the various UCs, but also Chinese medicine professionals in the community. Um, but like, like Dr. Shubat mentioned, by the end of March, we had a study design that we had not chosen a formula. So we consulted Dr. Kaki Huey at the center, as well as Dr. Shulan Ma and others um, to help come up with a formula. And so we we did we did come up with the, the uh, um, we, we decided on, uh, Qingfei Baidu Tang. But there was literally 
no information published about this formula and um, maybe just a couple of papers that Dr. Wei Jun Zhang helped us locate uh, in terms of potential side effects from the formula. What we had was mainly information that was coming from the hospitals and reports clinically. And so that's when we reached out to Dr. John Chen and it was really extraordinary to have his help to help us establish some safety measures for using this formula, as well as Dr. Zev Rosenberg, who's kept us on track with maintain, you know, importance of pattern differentiation, and Dr. Willow Liu and um, helped us establish safety for each individual herbs chemically. And Dr. Hua Bing Wen was one of the few practitioners during this time that was using. Uh, this formula with his patients. So he was extremely helpful at, as well. Um, and I, I just, there are others who contributed to this uh, and they're not here, but um, I do, uh, we really appreciate their input and the webinars that were presented during this time. And like I said, there was just very little information or anything published. Now, when you go onto Google and you do a, a PubMed search, you'll find a lot of information on this QFPD. But um, back then in March, um, there was nothing really. So um, Dr. John Chen referred to this text earlier, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But we were really fortunate that we had access to this clinical guidelines that was produ um, produced by the Chinese government, but also, you know, the the the, um, the national um, administration for traditional Chinese medicine from the people of the Republic of China, and um, and this was a published on February, 2020. And so this is one of the texts that we use as we continue to build the study. And in this text, um, what I didn't include in here, uh, but Dr. John Chen mentioned earlier was the recovery stage. But as you see on the right uh, column, excuse me, the left column in clinical classifications. So the new coronavirus was uh, delineated into four case, uh, four types of cases, mild, general cases, severe cases, and, and critical cases, and, and, and lastly, recovery uh, phase, which um, I believe Chinese medicine could be an, have enormous impact on as well. But on the, on the right column, the authors of the text um, did give us some differentiation of the patterns. However, it's a bit more complex than, than it seems. So, Again, we'll start with the medical observation phase when the, the case is not confirmed. Um, there are these formulas like Huo Shang Cheng Qi San and Lian Hua Qing when um, capsules when used. Uh, but again, we, the, when a person is confirmed uh, to have COVID, the first line formula that was used is Qing Fei Bai Dutang, which is appropriate for mild, uh, general, as well as severe cases when used alone. But it can also be used in critical cases. And I've highlighted in red here the diagnosis that uh, the differential patterns uh, and diagnosis that the authors uh, uh, included in this text. And it's, it's not simply just um, differentiation based on Shahan Lun. Um, um, postulates. <laughs> There's also, as you can see, like under general cases, the terms such as damp poison obstructing the lungs, and under severe cases, the terms such as lung blocked by epidemic toxins. So surely this is not something that's um, clearly um, explained in Shanghan Lun, but more uh, bringing in the precepts of the Wen Yi Lun. So this is different from Wen Bing, but the Wen Yi Lun is the, the treatise um, that was developed by Dr. Wu uh, Yao Ke in the Ming Dynasty during the 16th century. And it talks about the treaties of epidemics and associate with how transmissions of plagues um, happen. And particularly the difference, another key difference is it talks about the incubation period of a virus um, and the, uh, the pathogen is entry is mainly through the nose and the mouth. Whereas in Shanghai Lun, the, the entry is through the skin. And, and Shanghai Lun deals with, of course, as many of us know, you know, invasion of external pathogen and mainly due to seasonal changes. But with this type, so here with COVID, we're not just, we're not just dealing with, um, we're not just dealing with external pathogen. This particular pathogen is, uh, sort of an invisible type of pathogen that 
um, can affect old or young, um, strong or weak. Um, anyone is susceptible to getting infected. And so I, what I did with these symptoms, um, so just keep these symptoms in mind for later on in the presentation and how uh, we were able to incorporate this into, into the study. And oh, just another few comments about the formula Ching Fei Bai Du Tong. So this formula is really um, effective for um, when, when there's multiple um, um, pa uh, pathogen pathogens in, in various parts of the body. So it's appropriate to use, but once the symptoms subside, then the formula should um, be stopped. And then uh, it's also not appropriate to be used as a prevention. However, it is appropriate to be used in condition where we see symptoms in long COVID cases. So this is Dr. Uh, Zhang Bo Li on the right side. He is 72, is a 72 year old physician that uh, works in Wuhan and is still there. And he is the main uh, developer of the formula and along with his colleagues on the um, left side there. So by February of 2020, the Chinese government as well as the tradition, the administration of TCM, they jointly recommended QFPD for um, for the for the use for the treatment of COVID based on clinical um, efficacy, and the vice president of the Beijing University of um, Traditional Chinese Medicine around this time uh, noted as well the wide distribution of this formula throughout the province. And also, lastly, I wanted to share like. Also during this time, there was a field hospital that was established um, to, for the kind of like the, um, for the overflow of patients to help out with the hospitals. And most of these practitioners and doctors were Chinese medicine doctors. And um, there were about 560 plus patients. And uh, most of the patients recover, I mean, all of the patients um, recovered uh, without getting into the um, severe and critical stages. And um, no one, actually there were no fatalities among in this group. And more importantly, the staff and the physician and practitioner, no one got infected um, in this field hospital. And recently, Dr. Wen shared with me just about three weeks ago, there was also um, news um, from another hospital of similar um, setup with 580 patients. Um, and 90% of these patients were affected by the new Delta variant and 90% recovered. And, and so far there was no uh, fatalities either. So Dr. John Chen mentioned this as well earlier about the Chinese um, composition of the, the Chinese herb composition of Qing Fei Bai Du Tang. And many of us were familiar with this formula, uh, these formulas. So Ma Xing Shi Gan Tang, Shi Gan Ma Huang Tang, Xiao Chai Lu Tang, and Wu Ling San. And in addition, the authors of this formulation, they added four herbs. So every herb that you see in each box are the herbs that are included in the formula. What they did, what they left out was, um, is I, I kept it in the black ink. So Renshin, Datsa, and Wu Weizu were kept out of the formula. Um, so the additional herbs have their particular purposes. All, together, they address issues in all the three jowls, middle, excuse me, upper, middle, and lower jowls. And it's very interesting because some of the clinical presentations that I've observed and my peers have observed and those who um, with the Delta variant is that um, these four additional herbs are, are very relevant and useful in addressing the, the, the current presentations with the Delta variant. So again, Ma Xing Shi Gan Tang um, is traditionally, as we know in Shanghai, addresses Tai Yang uh, symptoms and patterns as well as Shi Gan Ma Huang Tang. Um, Shao Chai Hu Tang, it's, uh, it, it also has uh, antiviral as far as as well as various cars anti carcinogenic properties and and very importantly it helps promote lymph drainage so again you know when you learn the pathogen particularly we mentioned that the toxin the pestilence it attacks and tends to 
hide in the half interior, half exterior areas of the body. So for those of us you know, familiar with Shan Han Lun, we know that's the Xiaoyang stage of disease, where the disease is half in the interior, half in the exterior. But also within the body, we're talking about like the interstitial spaces, um, such as the pericardium or um, the um, pleura. So Xiao Chai Tang plays a really important role in, in this formula. And uh, Wu Ling San as well deals with um, the need to kind of dispel the pathogen from the body. And, and that's one of the main tenets of the Wen Yi uh, Lun is that we, when there's a pestilence and toxins in the body, the dispersing of the phlegm and the dampness is very important in addition to the dispelling of the pathogen. Um, and the additional herbs um, you'll see on the brown uh, box, the additional herbs help to support and protect our GI functioning um, for, for those of you um, that have, um, have are going through this uh, um, condition. So it also has anti-diarrheal, anti-emetic effects, um, and regulating the upper, middle, lower jowls as well, as I mentioned earlier. So again, as you can see, you know, QFPD is a complex formula of 21 herbs, but perhaps it's the most appropriate or one of the more appropriate given the complex nature of COVID-19. And I describe it as, as, as a multi-targeted formula. Not only, so for instance, with Mashing Shi Gan Tang, you know, we're not just, the formula is not just addressing the lungs and the respiratory issues, but other, again, in these interstitial areas and help to prevent the, um, the overactive inflammatory response. And sugar ma huang tang as well is, is very effective for the lungs, for asthmatic conditions, inflammation, tonsillitis, or throat, you can see there. And again, Xiao Chai Hu Tang has such an important role, um, probably one of my favorite formulas in this list. Um, it, you know, it goes to the liver as well as is having antiviral and assisting the lymph system for drainage. And Wu Ling San also helps in the lower jowl of draining the pathogen from, from, the, from the interstitial space places. And the additional herbs, you know, you know all the, together, they, they go to the, the lungs, the spleen, stomach, but as well as address, addressing the large intestine. So we know that, you know, COVID, the spike protein and COVID-19 attaches to the ACE2 receptors. And so there's ACE2 receptors, not only in the lungs, but also in the large intestine and the liver. Um, and currently there are two published articles on the mechanism of QFPD and how does it benefit um, in face of COVID-19. And there are three um, areas, domains that they uh, were able to identify. And one is that it has antiviral effects as well as anti-inflammatory and, and also kind of re regulation of these metabolic pathways where the virus, it just, um, that the virus used to uh, replicate itself. So um, this formula helps to disrupt, disrupt these various pathways. So we didn't use the, um, we, we, let me correct that. We tried to stay as true to the formula as possible uh, to the original formula QFPD. We did modify it though, however, and the reason why we modify it is mainly for safety issues. Um, in addition to the fact that the study team um, were thinking, well, if, you know, if the study outcome was not favorable, that modified QFPD would not negatively impact the original formula. And lastly, there was no intention on the study team for, for commercial, commercialization of the, um, the modified um, product. So how were the safety issues addressed? So this is when uh, Dr. John Chen was really instrumental in helping us establish the safety uh, measures in the study. Uh, we looked at every single herb, uh, the caution and contraindications um, of the 21 herb formula, um, and especially the herb drug interactions. And there were many, many um, that we needed to take in consideration. And any, uh, any particular drug, even if it was caution for news, we include that in the exclusion criteria. And again, three, the most contentious or controversial herbs were um, 
not controversial, but it was it was you know it was it was brought up a lot of discussion among our Chinese medicine um, experts in the community as well as within the, the study team. Um, so Kong Donghua, as Dr. John Chen mentioned earlier, because of the, you know, is a um, it has a pyrolizidine um, alkaloid. It is a pyrolizidine alkaloid, and so it can create um, liver toxicity or potentially create hepatotoxic um, situation, as well as being carcinogenic. And although we can use it in folks with liver disorders, but it would be an, an extreme. Um, extreme caution. So we had to modify it. And what we did not change, um, Ma Huang and Xixin, of course, many of we know that Ma Huang um, is an ephedrine alkaloid and is very stimulating, particularly to the central nervous system and the cardiovascular nervous system. And so those that are on anyone on medication that could interact, uh, um, the medication could interact with Ma Huang, we just um, we took that into consideration and we put in the exclusion criteria, uh, but we kept Ma Huang in uh, just being very strict with uh, who we include into the study. And with Shishin, you know, it, it has a risolocic acid and that um, trace amounts of it. So we wanted to keep this as well because um, for the type of respiratory conditions, or the lung issues that we were seeing, Shishin was really hard to, to replace. And so um, we needed the Shishin that we use in this study formulation um, is not, has non-detected uh, levels of aristolytic acid according to the FDA um, regulations. And lastly, the team included a Chinese herbal medicine medical monitor, uh, which is the role I serve to oversee any adverse effects um, uh, with the study medication. And if uh, there were any that were noted, then it, that this would be advised to the medical monitors, which is Dr. Andrew Shubov and, and Dan Slater. And, you know, I just want to make also make a note that there was a lot of discussion on whether or not to keep Ma Huang or to substitute it. And uh, Dr. John Boling, Boli himself, uh, we were able to be in contact with his secretary and he gave us potential substitutions as well because the formula originally is used in Wuhan, which is very cold and damp. And so we were concerned that with the drier, arid environment here in California, how would that affect um, people's response to the formula? And so uh, substitutes such as Shangru um, was, was strongly recommended among uh, Chinese medicine practitioners as well, and for and also substitute Shishin. But at the end, we, we, we kept these herbs so that we can keep the formula as intact as possible, and yet at the same time maintain safety for participants in the study. So this is the inclusion criteria. Uh, basically, um, yeah, anyone of age of 18 or older is, is, can, can enroll um, uh, to, can apply for um, the study, um, proof of positive COVID-19 diagnosis and willing to limit alcohol and cannabis and dairy consumption. Originally, we made this as a requirement, but we were concerned that it would turn too many people away. So we turned into a recommendation instead. And then also um, participants would, be able to would need to be able to communicate with our study staff, um, as well as write down the daily symptoms. So we, for safety monitoring. So these safety, this exclusion criteria um, applies to all three studies um, of the Mach 19 study. Uh, so any, any yes answers to these questions in red would exclude um, a person from being uh, participating in the study. And we would recommend it, them to immediately seek, seek their physicians of counsel. Um, and in addition to the other side, the exclusion criteria. So because of the formula, um, anyone taking other investigational drugs to treat COVID were excluded from the study, um, as well as anyone with liver disease, renal disease, uncontrolled hypertension. So here is interesting because you're bringing back Ma Huang. So um, 
some will say, well, you know, hypertension is contraindicated. Yes, but the FDA gave us a requirement, like if a person has uh, control hypertension, they were eligible to, to join and participate in the study. And, um, and also pregnant and breastfeeding women were also excluded from the study. We had additional um, exclusion criteria just for the herbal arm of the study. And again, this is due to the herb drug interaction that can possibly um, come up. And so just to be safe, we put it on a list. And so anyone taking any of these medications uh, would be uh, excluded from the study. So this is my uh, attempt to do some differentiation. Uh, please forgive the busyness of this slide. Uh, and it, this is my humble attempt, I would say. <laughs> um, this, so again, you know, revisiting the four categories of COVID as the authors describe mild cases, ordinary cases, severe cases, and critical cases. So in the mild cases, again, um, we can see patterns of the Taiyang um, from Shahan Lun in there. And in red is what the authors of the clinical guidelines, their diagnosis of the conditions. So they kept cold damp obstructing the lungs and damp heat obstructing the lungs in the mild cases. And when we get into the general cases of what's often seen with COVID um, is that all three stages, we can see symptoms from Tai Yang, Yang Ming and Xiao Yang in the general type of cases. and. Um, so moving in, and there, there is a, the next block, the, the blocks in red is for uh, patterns that are rooted with warm exterior pathogenic invasions. And so I, the authors of the clinical guidelines, they, they, they put this under the severe cases and um, and yes, I, I, I put it in between because there's still fever and um, there's epidemic toxin, but this is still treatable. Um, the severe cases uh, um, also we'll see, we'll con continue to see fever even beyond the Xiaoyang stage um, and irritability as well. And we're also getting to the nutritive yin level as well, how we understand the precepts and when being. And tai yin, we see, start seeing patterns of tai yin and Xiaoyin in these severe cases. And again, the red box, um, the authors, um, the guidelines describe this as flaring heat in the qi and yin level where we may see bleeding symptoms and potential convulsions. And then the critical stage, which most of us will, will, will we would not be seeing uh, such patients, uh, but again, internal block and outward desertion. This is when ventilation would, um, would be needed for, for patients under this very critical stages. And so, these symptoms, so I, what I did was I took the symptoms that the authors in the clinical guidelines um, uh, mentioned in their text, as well as the Shanghai Lin symptoms, and as well as the Wen Bing uh, symptoms, as well as um, the um, potential cautions and contraindication for the herbs in the 21 herb formula uh, QFPD. And I condensed it into this daily diary, which participants are asked to fill out daily during the 14 study period, uh, 14 day study period. And uh, the, the, what's highlighted is the uh, um, symptoms of COVID and the rest are key symptoms that I felt would help us, uh, number one, um, to help with safety monitoring. And number two, give us, help us gather information for a retrospective analysis of the data to see, for instance, which patterns were at higher risk or which patterns recovered better. So even in the eighth edition of the clinical guidelines, there the authors don't mention or give us a percentage of the various patterns that are, that are susceptible or are at high risk. And so this um, patients are also, the, they rate their, their symptoms according to our symptom scoring scale, or zero through four. Um, and lastly, just a quick summary um, before I turn the floor back to Dr. Shubov. And, you know, it's not just about 
the formula, but the clinical implications and mainly like the Chinese herbs and mushrooms can play an important role as the pandemic continues and cases of long COVID increase. Um, and if the study establishes safe um, once, hopefully the once the study establishes safety, this could potentially open doors for Ma Huang to legally be available for practitioners in the future. And I hope this presentation will give you inspiration for advanced learning of the formulas and the trust and the classics to build you know, our clinical acumen. And lastly, you know, we'll, we need your help to spread the word and recruit um, during this recruitment stage of um, the study. And I'm going to turn this floor back to Dr. Shubal. Hi, again. Thank you very much, Dr. Cao. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for that. For that. Um, so we have a plan, we have a formula, we have a reason for it. Another little bit is that we have, um, uh, we have, we have a treat today after this talk, we're gonna have a Q and A with Dr. John Chan and also Dr. Zeb Rosenberg, who had uh, a huge role to play in helping us determine this. Um, and so uh, we'll get to, you know, talk to the group of us. And so I want to actually have quite a bit here to talk about, about the regulatory hurdles, but I'm, hurdles, but I'm going to try to get through this relatively quickly so we can make sure that we have time for questions afterwards. So these are the major categories of challenges that we had to deal with. The first was the supply. So having an idea of an herbal formula is just the first of, um, you know, it, it, the rubber started hitting the road when we actually wanted to find out what we had to find out what we're actually giving to patients. So we started to work with, um, with uh, herbal suppliers and realized the, the real challenges here. So the first thing is that Chingpei Pai Du Tang is an herbal decoction. You can't blind an herbal decoction. You can't, uh, it, you know, it, it, yeah, there's no way to blind it. And actually later on, the FDA told us not to use masking agents to change the color or the smell of things. Um, so we need to use capsules and you can condense a, a decoction into granules and then Put those granules into capsules, but the best that we could condense was about seven to one, which still ended up with 20 out. The, you know, the formula is 200 grams. And so if we condense it down to 28 grams, that's still almost 60 capsules. We determined, we felt that the, the maximum that we can expect a study participant to take would be eight capsules, three times a day. Um, which was only 12 grams out of 28 grams. Now to make matters worse, once we started actually this, the, talking about this process, we learned that we also needed about 50% filler in the capsules. So that brings it back to 120 capsules a day. It was, this was a brick wall. So as soon as we got going, here was a brick wall. Again, what to do. We uh, were fortunate enough to work with Suntem Laboratories and, and um, they uh, were downright philanthropic with their ability to tolerate us and our demands and our, our needs here. Um, there, was, there are specialized techniques that, we were, uh, that were available to us if we um, brought it down to, uh, to, to allow us to bring the excipient, which is the fill, filler, down to five to 10%, but that still led to a suboptimal dose. So, Again, in other words, we can deliver an equivalent of 74 grams out of to the 200 gram formula. We again brought this to our panel of herbalists and generally speaking, their answer, their reactions were kind of, you know, grumbling. And I guess this is, this is counts as basically the minimum effective dose we would think, but maybe we can extend the duration of treatment. So um, the typical duration is three to six days. This is a 14 day, this will be a 14 days duration. You know, these are the kinds of compromises that we didn't expect to have to make early on. Um, and we were fortunate to have a lot of people to, to hang back on. It looks like now actually there are other clinical trials that are using a similar kind of uh, thing, 14 days of a, of a lower encapsulated dose. Um, now, beyond this, there was a lot more that was required of our supplier. And again, hats off to the team at Suntan for working with us. Uh, we needed to create a dedicated extract here on very short notice with all of the botanical raw materials available for testing. Um, we'll talk about the testing that's required in great detail in a minute. Um, we'll also, we also need some herbs that are very highly regulated. Shi Shin is very hard to come by it because it has, um, because of the, the, the potential of aristolocic acid which causes gen like genuine harm in, in patients. So the shishin that's available has to have undetectable 
quantities of aristolochic acid and, and be able to prove it uh, based on mass spec. And uh, each of the other herbs had to, uh, had to pass each of the other requirements. Now, it's one thing for a company to state that their herbs can pass each of these strict requirements. It's another thing for us to get several months into the process and then be counting on um, these being passed. So talking about the regulatory requirements that we need to do, uh, let's get into the TLAs, the three-letter acronyms. We had to deal with the FDA, the IRBs, and the DEAs. Um, one D, DEA. Now, the FDA, of all the groups, actually, um, somehow, I, maybe I'm a little bit uh, uh, excessively on social media, but it, there seems to be some misinformation about the uh, intentions of the FDA and Chinese medicine or the or alternative medicine in general. We worked very closely with them through this whole period, and I can tell you for certain, and I'm not paid to say this, but they were there was not a hint of bias against Chinese medicine. And actually, when when we came, uh, when we had a limit to the ability that we can meet their demands or their requirements, uh, they were just a little bit flexible enough uh, when it counted in a way that made it clear that they wanted to see this. And um, first of all, we had to use the FDA because this was not a botanical supplement. This was a drug. And a drug is defined by its intention. And because we were intending to look at the rates of COVID hospitalization, we are intending to use it as a drug to treat COVID-19 and there is no way around this. There's other ways of, of not having to classify an herb as a drug that didn't apply to us. We had to go through this, whereas many clinical trials might not. Um, if you want to submit an investigational new drug application, um, these are the steps to do, and this might help to explain our timeline here. Um, we begin the conversation with the appropriate FDA representative. You submit what's called a pre-IND. So, Take a step back, an IND application um, is what's required to classify an investigational new agent as a investigational drug. And that gives you license under the FDA um, to then submit it. So we were able to submit it to the customs agency uh, to have it imported to the IRB to have it, uh, to be able to deliver it to patients. So the IND is considered the IND application. So we use that for short. We submit a pre-IND uh, uh, application which is kind of like our master's thesis for why we think this will be helpful. They have 60 days to look through this with a fine tooth comb and then um, summon us to a meeting in Washington, DC. In our case, this was just a very stressful phone call. Um, and we got a favorable response where they, they had some very, very helpful, although frustrating, but not critical uh, advice for us. And genuinely, uh, all of their advice basically helped us make a better study. Uh, they needed to make sure it was safe and it was going to be uh, effective. They added us. Uh, they, they added some some recommendations to make sure it was good. So they were like a strict teacher for us. It was actually a very helpful relationship. Um, at the same time, we recognized that they were burning the midnight oil to try to get all these other things going at the same time. So they were working quite hard during this time. Uh, we submitted our final IND application in July, and then if that's approved, they have 30 days to approve it, and you get a study may proceed letter, hopefully within 30 days. If not approved, the FDA will issue a clinical hold. And that's what happened to us uh, because we, at this time, we had not completed manufacture of the MQFPD. And so we could not actually submit the complete IND application until we had the complete uh, uh, drug manufactured and then submitted that for all the requisite testing. And so that didn't happen until April. And then the IRB had to take another two months. So that's why we just started uh, in June of this year for this, this section. Incidentally, uh, uh, hats off to Marlene Barrow, who's a, who's a person who works at the University of California through multiple centers. She's an FDA liaison. Without her, none of this would, or many other studies would have been possible. Um, so anybody that's interested in botanical drug research needs to be aware of this document. This is a, a 2006 update to a 2004 document of the FDA that basically outlines their uh, requirements for botanical drug development. And it's actually very much the same as their requirements for anything else, except with the uh, the additional, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more, you know, it'll, it'll become obvious. But the first two components of this are chemical constituents of prior human experience. And this is basically our master's thesis. Um, and um, uh, uh, this is basically based on, on prior data. Uh, so we don't have to go into this. This would be where you had your preclinical pre or lab data. What really got us stuck is this chemistry manufacturing controls data. So for each of the 21 herbs, the FDA requires that we have tests for elemental impurities, microbial limits, residual pesticides, including parent pesticides, 
aflatoxins, foreign materials, and adulterants. So this is pretty, well, um, step one. This is step one. Uh, I'll also pull this out because this is fascinating to me. They also require that they determine whether a plant species is determined to be endangered, threatened, or entitled to protection, or in a critical habitat that has been determined to be endangered or threatened. This, this to me is a, a crowning achievement to integrative medicine over the last 20 years, that this is in the FDA guidance documents for botanical drug research. They're, they're, they consider their purview to be beyond safety of humans, but to safety of the environment. I, I think this is very well-intentioned. Um, uh, other things they, so the next section, botanical drug substance characterization. This is interesting because each of the botanical drug, each of the 21 herbs, not only do they need a quantitative description of what this drug substance is, is they need a qualitative description of the drug substance. And this is interesting because this differs from most pharmaceuticals, which the qualitative description isn't so important, but as we may know, um, in herbal medicine, uh, the qualitative description is, is primarily how, how substance is described. And then we have to talk about the manufacturing process, which turned into a huge administrative delay because we needed non-disclosure agreements between multiple institutions. It was a mess. Um, and then finally, we, if we take our final product and we have to um, uh, subject it to all these additional tests. So again, it was you know one thing to make all these um, plans uh, to make these tests and all these assurances that they're actually going to come up within limits and then uh, it's quite a relief when they actually uh, met those limits. This is also, I'm sorry, I didn't mention uh, Ma Huang then has to be uh, characterized for its uh, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine content, quantified, uh, Shishin. And um, there were some other things that we got, we were able to skirt. There's, uh, there's uh, if you were actually developing a botanical drug, the requirements are much higher in terms of you need to develop basically agriculture, farm to, to capsule approach to make sure that year after year, you have batch to batch consistency. And we were able to not do that precisely because we, as Dr. Kao said, we have no intention for commercialization here. This is an open source study. This is for you guys to commercialize. Um, Andrew, and, five minutes left. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so with that, this has been approved for this single batch that we have. Uh, and uh, that really was the only way that we, the saving grace for us to be able to actually meet this requirement. Um, I'll just skip through some of this stuff. Then we got to move to the IRB, um, which is exists at every institution. Every clinical study has to go through an IRB. When you have multiple um, uh, clinical centers, then you, you can choose one of the IRBs and typically the other ones will rely upon it. If, I, if we had to do it over again, we might've chosen the IRB a little bit differently. Um, that's all I have to say about that. And then the DEA usually doesn't get involved in these things, but had to because of the presence of Ma Huang which is a regulated substance. It's not a scheduled substance, it's a list one chemical. That's, class, that's a classification used for uh, precursor chemicals of illicit substances. So amphetamines can be made using, using um, ephedrine. Not ma huang really, but ephedrine. And that makes it a list one chemical, but unfortunately nobody really deals with these. Uh, and so it took several agents before I could find somebody that knew what, how, to, how to guide me in the right way. We went on a, a, you know, a barked up a rog tree to try to become an importer and then learn that you can just hire a licensed importer, um, which is a little costly, but, but much more much more straightforward. So we had the FDA approval, we had the IRB to, well, we're working with the IRB, and then we hit another brick wall, is the political considerations. This is not really so much the brick wall the next slide is, but we, um, by the time the summer hit, uh, people sobered up a little bit. There was um, uh, people returned to their normal routine. They got um, hit by all sorts of you know uh, lingering priorities that uh, that suddenly came onto their desk, and there was a change of priorities. UCSF had to back out. UCI also had to uh, back out a few months later. La Jolla Immunology and Cedar Sinai Medical Center; these were groups that we were working with that also had to um, had to back out. But the big hurdle was. The COVID task force. This now back to the spring of 2020. Everybody wanted to help. Everybody wanted to have a clinical trial. Um, anybody studying any supplement wanted to put this put theirs in, and this clogged the system for um, things that were prioritized by the uh, by the uh, by the institutions. Uh, priorities are generally uh, predicted as uh, things that are funded by the NIH, and things that are funded by the NIH did not include Chinese herbal medicine. Um, actually, specifically, the uh, National Institute of Health uh, did not want to look into therapeutics at this time. So we were kind of stuck and we attempted to ask them, well, 
was basically these COVID task forces were set up to try to gatekeep for re keep resources to make sure that the prioritized studies could continue. And um, we hit uh, troubles with both of them. Uh, this led to a several month delay, frankly, to um, until we could find out how to go go around it. Uh, and then ultimately, um, you know, we tend to be the we happen to be the last people standing now. Uh, a lot of that traffic is cleared up, and now both COVID task forces at both institutions have given us the green light to basically um, work as as we need to. Uh, there were some other institutional resources that were that took a lot of work to try to figure out how to get mobile phlebotomy to go to the right lab. We needed uh, nasal swabs, so we needed to find uh, labs within our institutions that would do those, a research laboratory to work, websites, legal teams, um, external vendors, all sorts of things. So, um, and then once that all came through, we had to you know import this and et cetera, et cetera. So this ended up being our timeline, and this kind of explains why these things are now just coming out now. Um, that as you'll see here in the beginning, we worked very, very quickly. Uh, it was declared a pandemic March 11th. We had our initial meeting March 26th. We submitted our pre-IND on April 8th, and then we're able to, um, uh, sorry, we our early, early April. Two months later, we were able to submit our IND um, right after they submitted us our pre-IND. And then the mushrooms were actually approved pretty quickly. In April, it wasn't until April till uh, we were able to get everything else lifted uh, for the Chinese herb component and then took another two months for the IRB to then um, allow us to move forward with that. So here we are today with our current challenge of recruitment. And um, now the actual, you know, as it as the story went, we finally get our approval June 5th. This was the nadir of uh, COVID-19, there was, it was almost, um, well, there was a nice little window there. Unfortunately, with the Delta variant, we now have an opportunity to begin recruitment again. And we do ask for some of your help if you know of anybody. Um, this is the, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it here. Um, these are uh, phone numbers that you can call, you can direct patients to call. Basically our requirements are that people live within LA or San Diego. That's because we need a mobile phlebotomist to not only go to their place, but also to send their blood to our labs. Um, and blood cannot be sent, you know, uh, it has to be delivered uh, in person. Uh, there's also nasal swabs that have to go to a different lab. There's a whole logistical thing behind there. And also our licenses only extend um, to the area. Uh, and yeah, please feel free to contact us and thank you all for, for listening. I'd like to open this up to the Q&A. Um, and uh, invite uh, Dr. John Chen, Dr. Zev Rosenberg, Dr. Sachs, and Dr. Kao back up. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, just a measure of how fabulous this talk has been so far is that many of the questions people have asked, um, you've already answered. Um, but why don't we go ahead and start with Zev since we haven't heard from him before. And if Zev, if you want to open your microphone and just tell us a little bit about your involvement in the development of this project. Okay, I didn't prepare any remarks for this panel. I just thought it would just take questions, but I'm glad to oblige. Um, I would compare the situation that we've been working with to like the proverbial Chinese dragon or the Leviathan, it's like a fire breathing dragon of a study that submerged underneath the ocean waves for a period of time. And then all of a sudden with the Delta variant coming to the fore and the final approval in June of the study of going through all these hoops with the FDA and IH, et cetera, it just burst out of the water again and opened its mouth and started breathing fire again. So now we've got a nice fire breathing dragon in our hands. And, uh, you know, I see Gordon almost every week. We always take long walks together and, uh, and have dinner together. And, He's kept me posted on everything that's been going on. And um, it was a, it, at the beginning back last spring when we really had no idea what was really going on. It was really quite um, wonderful to meet such a wonderful group of people from UCLA who at the uh, Integrative Health Studies Center there and um, start working with them and start putting ideas together and looking at research coming out of China and also looking at more classical traditional sources because um, one of the amazing things is that the Chinese have a 2000 year history of dealing with and working with epidemics and uh, have developed a huge armamentarium 
of both uh, herbal medicine and acupuncture moxibustion strategies for treating with these various types of epidemics. So it gave us a really strong foundation to deal with it. One of my own personal interests for the last several decades has been studying how the Chinese handled these epidemics and the formulas and treatments that they came up with. So it was a, a real time possibility in learning how to apply some of this knowledge. After years of study and teaching at Pacific College, specifically of uh, Shang Han Lun and Wenbing courses, both of which I initiated at the San Diego campus and then the New York campus and Chicago campuses afterwards. So that's my piece there. This is a question for everybody, and I know it's kind of a large question, um, but for each of you, if you had to start over again, what, if anything, would you do differently in this process? I, I feel like I, I can answer that. I, I mean, there's a... Um, uh, this was a, uh, yeah, I, I, there's some tactical things that I don't know if anybody really was able to advise us on at the time. So things like which IRB to use, if we can find something a little bit faster, maybe potentially, um, uh, we would have, there's a lot. I think we would have ended up with, a very, with the same formula. The intention behind the formula was really uh, dictated based on this was the best thing we had at the time and we didn't want to mess with something that was proven and um, and our, our goal you know if we couldn't do something that was in, that was true to the spirit of Chinese medicine in terms of pattern diagnosis we should at least keep true to the formula so I don't think we would have changed the the things that uh, that are on top on, on on the surface that are the biggest hurdles of, of Shishin and uh, Ma Huang um, what I would have changed would have been, um, wow. Probably, you know what actually would have been great was if we would have had a, uh, a pre-made uh, formula that is already uh, manufactured somewhere and we could find a supplier that had each of the component herbs available in the same, of the same batch and we could test, send that for testing, um, if that makes sense. And that would have, uh, because we needed to do this all prospectively. And it takes time to make an herbal formula, to make a, a dedicated batch of granules. Um, it took a long time. And uh, that probably would have shaved some time off of, our, off of us. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'd say in the early days of this, if I had it to do over again, I would have uh, listened to uh, Andrew Shubov a little more closely when he was urging us to try and get our application into the IRB as quickly as possible. And I was trying to negotiate a whole team of people and you know multiple people's schedules and all that. And maybe we dragged it on for a week or two longer than, than we might have. And it turns out that was probably critical timing because it was after we had submitted our application to the IRB and they were ready, pretty much almost ready to approve it. I don't think the IRB was so much the issue. It was the COVID uh, Clinical Research Trials Task Force that then, while we were in process with the IRB, forced the hand of the IRB to freeze our study, which otherwise the IRB would have approved. And so um, if it happened, the, the, the task force was actually created while we were in the process of waiting for our application with the IRB to, uh, to get through their process. If we had just gotten it in a little bit earlier, we might have been able to get our approval from the IRB prior to the task force, perhaps av averted all the delays from them. But um, anyway, hindsight is, you know, uh, 2020. I think for the profession, I think this is a the study, it's a big thing. I think it's actually historic. And I know John Chen has been doing work like this for many, many years and uh, the UCLA Center, but it really does, I, I don't like the term foot in the door so much as establish an actual study using Chinese medicine protocols in the treatment of a major pandemic. And I th think that's huge. And I think the implications of the study, even though it's a humble study with a relatively small number of volunteers, 
it's still going to be really long-term historic in terms of the Chinese medical profession in the West. So. Any um, talk about combining with acupuncture in future studies? I'm certainly in favor of that. I think it's a great idea. And in China, of course, they have done that. There's a, maybe some of you on the panel know Liu Li Hong. He has done work in China, both with herbal medicine and using acupuncture in hospitals. I, it's not easy needling in a hazmat suit. And the, that's what he had to do with his team in one of the hospitals in Wuhan at the height of the epidemic there. But um, it is possible. And apparently a lot of the patients really responded well. I don't know of any particular studies that were formally done. I'm sure there must be something in Chinese language. Nothing has come out in English at this point. I think that uh, perhaps um, uh, application of acupuncture might be beneficial, but I defer to my colleagues who are more learned in Chinese medicine than I am, might be beneficial, not so much in the treatment of acute COVID, but maybe in um, long COVID, in people who are suffering from chronic disability from COVID uh, as part of a multifaceted strategy. It's a tenacious, difficult condition. Loads of people are suffering from it, but Hopefully at that point, they're no longer infectious and it would be safe to needle them, but it probably will take a lot more than just acupuncture, but that might be a very helpful mo modality in a multifaceted setting. There, there are actually many, many studies that are, that are um, either been done or on, ongoing uh, in China. So there are many studies that focus on treatment of COVID-19. There are many studies that focus on uh, long COVID and it's not just herbal treatment. There's actually a lot, of, a lot of studies on herbal treatment, on acupuncture treatment, also on um, lifestyle, you know, so they do Tai Chi, uh, Qigong, and many others, and specifically for long COVID, you know, so there, there is not a shortage of ideas as far as what to, what to use to help these patients. The difficult part is, um, I, I don't think most TCM practitioners appreciate how long and how difficult it is to do a clinical study. You know, uh, it takes years and years and it costs a lot of money. So as much as we like to see more studies done in the US, we have to be very selective in our battles, you know, pick the ones that will make the most difference and then go with that, you know, instead of doing everything all at the same time. Yeah, and very exciting that you all chose herbs that can be controversial because they're the ones that work so well. So keeping somehow keeping it simple, but also not keeping it easy. Um, and on that note, there was some confusion, I think, among the audience about the availability of Mahuang in the United States. Some people felt like there was no availability. Um, so John, would you will be willing to address that a little okay. bit? And, Mahuang, Mahuang is somewhat in a uh, no man's land because FDA classifies everything as food, as dietary supplement, or as drug. And it specifically says that Mahuang is not a food because we don't eat Mahuang ephedra on a daily basis. Also, Mahuang doesn't supplement our diet. So FDA has shut down those two paths basically to uh, protect the general public. But if you read the original FDA documentation, they do leave a window for TCM practitioner. And it says that Ma Huang is not used in either of these fashion in traditional Chinese medicine. And therefore, if you stick with the traditional Chinese medicine means, uh, it is allowed. So what that means is if the herb was imported as raw herb, it is used as a decoction pursue it, you know, following a TCM practitioner's herbal prescription, then you are allowed to use it. So I do know that Kamwo in New York, they do carry this herb, they do dispense it as a decoction. So that's perfectly fine, but you're not gonna find Mahuang as in a capsule form at a retail center for weight loss because that is exactly what the FDA wants to get rid of. And that's exactly what they did. I also think many suppliers were Herbal suppliers in this in this country were very worried about liability issues after that runner who had the heart attack and died. Right. I, mean, I remember going to health food stores and seeing pep up supplements right in the checkout line, you know, with Mahuang in them, and uh, very irresponsibly done. And I, I blame 
some of the, at least a, a, a proportion of the nutraceutical industry for abusing right. our right to using that medicine. So I think there's a lot of fear of making it available. But yes, a Commonwealth by prescription will make it available to a practitioner, but it's not in any prepared products as far as I know at this point. I think another thing practitioner may also want to double check is make sure they check their um, insurance um, to make sure their malpractice insurance does cover the use of malware before they consider using it. Also, I'd like to add to this, Dr. Cockett Huey, he wrote a, um, a response to the FDA in 1999 regarding Ma Huang, and they asked for his opinion. And one of the reasons he said it was banned is because it's not because of the practitioners, as, as um, John pointed out, is because it was um, used uh, as diversion to use as part of making um, the methamphetamine. But, you know, using Ma Huang in a, and that was the main reason, you know, um, but Ma Huang used in a decoction, the DEA has no issues with that. Neither does the FDA, as, as John pointed out. Uh, we do have lots more questions, um, but I don't think we're going to get to them all because we do want to end on time. Um, but I'll just tell you the subject of the questions unless in, in case anybody wants to comment on them. We have a number of questions about timing like how do we provide timely administration of herbs when we're currently recruiting? So do patients progress to severe or even recovered by the time you can treat them? Um, and what do we do if a patient goes critical during the, the study, are they removed? Okay. So uh, anybody wanna comment on yeah, that? I'll, I'll, let me do that quickly. Uh, yeah, we are recruiting within the first few days of symptom onset where you have a strict limit of nine days, but really I, ideally between three and seven days of onset of symptoms or uh, um, of a, of a positive COVID test. And so we do want people to be symptomatic where we can help them, not necessarily asymptomatic um, uh, routine screening or something like that. Yes, if people are critically ill or become critically ill, they stop the medication uh, and we follow up with them afterwards. So uh, at that point, we do not follow them into the hospital. We do not, they do not, they, they're, they're done with us in terms of, um, uh, uh, they're onto the medical care. Uh, we Does do, anybody we do. want to have, have anything they want to say about um, dosing form? Some people had questions about why weren't we using decoctions or concentrates or various you know, granules, et cetera. Let me just speak really quickly about that, is that we, we have a, a limitation of the clinical trial um, forces and an artificial uh, uh, hand that, that binds us to having to have something that is blindable and of a lower dose than might be used clinically by you guys as practitioners. Um, so we're doing the best that we can with the constructs, the constraints that we have. Uh, and so we should not, the, the intention here is to demonstrate some safety and some value um, so that it could be widely used within the, your best, like the, the, the best uh, understanding of the practitioner. I also wanna point out that the Japanese use of herbal medicine, Kampo uses smaller, significantly smaller doses and still get strong effects. And I think that having a longer period of taking the herbs and the cumulative effect of it will still show to be efficacious clinically. That's my opinion, so. Well, as I said, we do have more questions, but luckily we'll hopefully have lots more opportunities to do more webinars. I wanna thank our speakers especially and thank LASA OMS, our co-host and all the folks at Pacific College. Uh, Diego Morales on our tech tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. So I hope to see you all soon in person in real time in Los Angeles or San Diego.